within the so-called tar sands and oil shales, the ones that are often described as equivalent to several Saudi Arabias. The net energy values for these are especially poor and in no way comparable to the 100 to 1 returns found in Saudi Arabia. Further, the water and environmental costs associated with them are disturbingly high. And what about renewable energy sources? Methanol, which can be made from biomass, sports a net energy of about 3, while biodiesel offers a net energy return of somewhere around 2. Corn-based ethanol, if we're generous, might produce a net energy return of just slightly over 1, but could also be negative according to some sources. If we add in all the other new sources for usable liquid fuels that we just talked about, we see that they are all somewhere on the face of the cliff. Unless we very rapidly find ways of boosting the net energy of these options, we'll simply find far less surplus energy for our basic needs and discretionary wants. Solar and wind are both capable of producing pretty high net returns, but these are producing electricity, not liquid fuels, for which we already have an extensive investment in distribution and use. Oh, and by the way, where's the so-called hydrogen economy on this chart? Right here. Because there are no hydrogen reservoirs anywhere on Earth, every single bit of it has to be created from some other source of energy, at a loss. In other words, hydrogen is an energy sink. In creating hydrogen, we always lose energy. And that's not pessimism. That's the law. The second law of thermodynamics, to be exact. Because hydrogen is a carrier of energy, not a source, it is more accurately described like this. A battery. Now, to make an absurd argument, because nobody would be this foolish, suppose Congress made the decision to, say, try and run our society on corn-based ethanol. What could we expect there? Well, if we adjust our graph to reflect that decision, we'll see a whole lot of red and very little green. The tax is very high, while our take-home pay is very low. By way of commentary, I find it somewhat telling that out of all the possible alternative energy sources, this is the one that Congress chose to advance. I mean, short of directly launching barrels of oil into outer space, it's hard to imagine a much more foolish idea. The important point here, though, is that even if the government completely subsidized ethanol to the point that it only cost you a penny a gallon to buy, we would soon find ourselves ruined. And the reasons why have already been covered. With less surplus energy, less societal complexity is possible. Under an ethanol regime, we'd find that many cherished job positions would simply vanish. Regulatory compliance specialists for food additives would have to revert to being farmers. Pediatric radiological oncologists would become uh, healers. And Midwest regional communications coordinators for Special Olympics would um, have to find something else to do. And so on. If we tried to live on ethanol as a liquid fuel, we'd quickly lose nearly all of the specialized jobs that we associate with modern society because there would be practically no surplus energy to use in support of that complexity. This diagram with a rich balance of reinvested and consumed energy would rapidly become this. Because of their low net energy, ethanol and other such poor energy sources are thoroughly incompatible with our current lifestyles. This turns into this. So let's review the two key concepts so far before moving on. Number 13, the price of energy is irrelevant. Net energy is everything. On this basis, both corn-based ethanol and hydrogen are dismal failures. Key concept number 14, social complexity is built upon surplus energy. If we want to maintain our society in its current form, we're going to have to master this concept and fast. Now, on to chapter 17c energy, and the economy. Thank you for listening.